Hello, welcome back, Super War Beyond fans. Uh, we're going to be going into our Beyond phase again, but this is going to be an, a special treat. Um, we're going to foray into the Super Friends animated series today, mostly because Tom has never seen the all-time best episode of Super Friends, which is my personal favorite, Universe of Evil. This is the episode that introduced the idea of the multiverse to DC cartoons. This actually Just DC media in general outside of the comics. I think this was yeah. the first. Um, yeah. Um, this actually predates uh, the episodes of Superboy, where we had a little bit of a multiverse flair. Hmm. Uh, Superboy still keeps the uh, the distinction of being the first live action. Yes. Uh, but this is the first ever. So uh, this is going to be exciting. And it's funny because you're underselling a little bit when you say Tom hasn't seen the all-time best episode. I don't think I've seen any episode. Well, so. we're definitely <laughs> going to have to come back to uh, Super Friends after this because there are two Superboy-related episodes that are very important. Okay. There, there is the the episode from when it was called Challenge of the Super Friends, where they do, uh, and it's the title of the episode is History of Doom, and we actually get to see an the actual comic um, origin of Lex Luthor. Hmm. You know, with with the uh, Superboy building the uh, the lab, and then the fire, and then the hair falling out. So um, it's uh, the same basic story that inspired luther unleashed yes that's interesting okay yep. maybe and we can we'll... do another comparison thing like we did with um superboy lost and uh all shook up and uh what was the original panic in the sky you know yes. maybe we can do just uh, a two part for that and we'll just compare the two that could be fun we'll yep. think about that and then the other episode is return of the phantoms which guess i'm guessing that you can figure out uh, what it means by phantoms. There's a ton of things phantoms could mean. I mean, phantom zone, I'm guessing. Yep. Okay. That's interesting. Yep. So um, I want, let's, let's get everybody ready. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm queued up and Tom's queued up. So I'm going to count you in with a three, two, one um, evil. Okay. We're going to the universe of evil. Um, so, Get ready. Three, two, one. Evil. <laughs> and I've got to say, I don't know if Warner Brothers remastered this show or if it's just someone uploaded like some AI upscales of the episodes to Internet Archive. But whoever put it on that website, I appreciate it because... Uh, this was an incredibly difficult episode for me just to find the right version of because, um, yeah, the fact that Super Friends seemed to change the name of the show every year certainly didn't help. Yeah, it was the Super Friends, then Challenge of the Super Friends, then it went back to Super Friends, then it was World's Greatest Super Friends, then it was Super Friends, the legendary superpower show, then mm. it was Superpowers uh, Galactic Guardians. And, you know, I thought it was weird when Superboy changed its name. It's got nothing well, on this show. Yeah. Now, as I understand, this episode, Universe of Evil, is written by uh, Mark Scott Zickrey, who is a very famous science fiction writer. Um, he's he's had many, many credits to his name, including Babylon 5 and Deep Space Nine. Hmm. Um It's always good when a uh, Star Trek writer comes into Superman or whatever. Well, the thing is, he started off here and went there. Oh, 
Oh, of course it would have been. Yeah, 1980. You know, this is what, the 70s, this episode? Yeah. It's like 77, yeah. 78. Yeah, so it would have had to have been the other way around. Yeah. So was this one of his like first writing gigs? Do you do you know? I think it, it just might have been. I think it might have been. Hmm. Um, one thing he said in interviews is he absolutely loved, you know, the classic comics and and stuff stuff when he was a kid. So hmm. you know, getting to play in this this uh, sandbox, as it were, was was uh, amazing. And if you noticed when 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 the uh, when they were coming out of the uh, what the, what we think is the Hall of Justice, it said right on it, Hall of Evil. Hmm. So that was our first indication that this is not where we think we're going to be. Yeah, I was just thinking that Batman, the way that he was in shadows there, seemed very dark compared to um, usual. Is he in red or is that just the lighting as well? No, he's actually in red. Now, I did like how uh, atmospheric and moody this episode is so far. Yeah. Um, the interesting thing is that this episode is inspired by two different things. Um, one, of course, being, you know, the crime, the classic crime syndicate of America from the Justice League comics. Mm. And also it's inspired by Mirror Mirror from Star Trek. I was going to say that. Yeah. It's, it's funny that he ended up writing for Star Trek later on because i was going to say this is a very mirror mirror concept and, especially since know, they gave robin a mustache i mean maybe they should have gone full goatee like spock had <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah it's it's odd seeing robin with a mustache well the thing the thing is that you know the reason why they didn't use the crime syndicate and i think this is this is the prevailing theory is that you know, to do all new designs for characters, you know, because remember the crime syndicate does not have the exact same costumes. It's all different. They would have had to create all new animation cells, but here all they have to do it's is mostly just, just colors. colors. Yeah. Yeah. Like maybe adding the, uh, the, it looks like, you, you know, Superman's got like, um, eye shadow or something. It almost looks like the crow or something mm. like that. Or Heath Ledger's yeah. Joker. Um, tiny little details like that, I imagine, would be a hell of a lot easier. And now, obviously, having not really seen any of Super Friends, I have no idea who that blue monkey is. Uh, that's is Greek. That from, is he even from the comics? Because maybe I've just he, never seen no, him. No, he's not from the comics. He was created exclusively for this show along with the wonder twins Zan and Jaina. well i know the wonder twins at least yeah i guess Z did you say his name is glick gleek gleek i i guess he's just like their version of robbie the robot from the fantastic four animated series a uh, herbie just herbie wait who's robbie the robot robbie the robot was from fan was from uh forbidden planet right <laughs> oh well so what's going on right now is evil Superman in Universe 2, we'll call it, is trying to cause Mount Vesuvius to erupt. And the Good real Superman, Superman is trying to prevent it. Yeah. And because they're doing it exactly at the same time in two different universes, it's causing a kind of... The walls of the fabric of reality are breaking down. Yeah. And this, I guess they just switched places or something. Yep. And you notice the scene where it's switching; it's it's going back and forth between light and dark, light and dark. It's mm. exactly the same sequence from start from Mirror Mirror, when uh, they're beaming up and the Enterprise changes. Hmm. And it is interesting that this show is the one that is doing a very mirror mirror thing because the animation style is very similar to the uh, Star Trek animated series, isn't it? So, yeah. I mean, do they not notice that his costumes are different color and his makeup 
has disappeared. <laughs> I think they do, but and he's also noticing that their costumes are off. Yeah, plus Aquaman's got a eye patch, unless that was just a Super Friends thing that I'm unaware of. No. <laughs> I like that. Hall of Evil, and there's even a little uh, little Satan head on the front of it. <laughs> yep. And you, you got to give props to actor Danny Dark. You know, he does such a great job as both standard and evil Superman. Hmm. Now the, the citizens are asking him, you know, wh why he's not going to save them. And he says, stop it. Why do you think I started it? Yeah. <laughs> And yeah, the Hall of Justice obviously is one of the things that even without seeing this show, everybody knows the Hall of Justice, you know. Yep. I think even the uh, CW stuff teased the Hall of Justice, but I think it was only in an episode in a parallel world. I don't think it was ever in the Prime universe, unless I'm remembering wrong. Mm. And it's interesting, it's instead of saying Great that. Scott, he says Great Satan. I like that. So this is done, you know, very similar to, you know, Mirror Mirror in the fact that, you know, in Mirror Mirror, Kirk and crew are pretending to be pirates. Hmm. And, their, and their counterparts are found out easy, you know, very easily because Spock's not a dope. Here, yeah. I mean, they say at the end, it's you know, it's easier for a what is it? It's easier for oh God, what was the word? It's easier for you as civilized men to prepare to pretend That's to be it. barbarians than it was for them as barbarians to pretend to be civilized men. Here, yeah. great, it's line. the exact opposite. Evil Superman is pretending to be civilized, hmm. which and leads me to believe that there is a Martha and Jonathan Kent in in the evil universe. And they raised him right, even though he decided to, you know, just be an evil. Yeah. Or maybe the Jonathan and Martha Kent in that universe were killed a little bit early or something, you know. Mm. You never know. I mean, usually one or both of them die at some point during his teenage years. But maybe if it happened slightly too soon before some of the key lessons have been learned. Who knows? Hmm. Not a bad plan, actually. Pretend to be good just long enough for his, you know, the plan to start working, start taking control. It's not bad. I mean, it's not the most complicated plan in the world, but <laughs> it definitely has merit. I still can't get over Robin with a moustache. How is he even old enough to grow it? Well, Robin is 16, 17. I mean, you know, True, so and it's not the best mustache. Yeah. yeah, and it's not exactly the thickest mustache in the world as well. So maybe the reason it's so thin is just because that's all he can grow. I remember when my mustache first started coming in. That's about the extent that I could grow for a while. End up looking like Gomez Adams. <laughs> And even though he's evil, he's still got the holyisms. <laughs> Has Batman's design changed any more than just the color? Like, are his ears taller than usual as well? Uh... Because I've seen some screenshots and stuff from this show, and I could have sworn they weren't quite that long. But maybe it's just because, you know, I don't know. Yeah, they, they look about the same to me. Hmm. Maybe it's just because um, I used to watch that. What was it? The uh, the new adventures of Batman and Robin 
or something, I think it was called. I know the ears are slightly shorter in that, but I think that's because it was more inspired by the Adam West show. So maybe yeah. that's why, you know. Oh, no, because, look, the ears are quite short here with regular Batman, but when he switches to evil Batman, they're huge. Oh, yeah, they are. They are longer. They're huh. short, but not short, short. Yeah. The other but one that just looks movie. like Batman, whereas the other one, it was almost like Batman in some of those Elseworlds ones where he was almost like a half bat, half vampire creature or whatever. Yeah. Maybe you would I mean, have like these horror artists coming in. Yeah, the evil Batman is, it, I mean, get, I, you know, it makes sense. You know, the, the ears are longer. Hmm. His colors are red. They're making him look like a devil. Yeah. It's a lot more intimidating. I, I, as a design choice, I cannot praise that enough. But I, you know, I wasn't sure until I saw the actual Batman appear. And the other, the other difference with Robin is that they elongated the top, the top of his um, mask. Mm. One thing that we forgot to mention is that when he first, when Evil Superman first arrived, and he's telling that, telling the uh, the guards that he needs to take the uh, the gold, the the joke that he uses, he says it needs more mining. Mining? What do you mean? I need to make it mine. It's not a bad joke. The only thing that annoys me a little bit is I could have sworn that Kryptonite from Parallel Earths didn't affect Superman. That was that was only established uh, during Infinite Crisis. Right. Okay. So this was pre that. Never mind. <laughs> it would have been fun though if they tried to capture Superman and chained him up with, with Kryptonite. And he's like, wait, I'm getting stronger. <laughs> like something like that might have been interesting. Just reverse the effects. Yep. Oh well. And now we see our first. In it's interesting yeah. seeing an evil version of that monkey thing yeah. as well. So this is Metropolis in this world. Looks yeah. more like Gotham. Trash everywhere. I do like the differences between the uh, the Earths. Okay, so here's the problem that I have with this scene. And even though I love this episode, why did he not just change to Clark Kent if he knows that Superman is hunted? Yeah. One thing I do like about this, because you have the characters explaining their motivations all the time, you could just take the audio from this and make a radio-only version, and it would still play. Yep. I mean, certain things would be lost, like, you know, the sign saying universe, uh, you know, what was it, the Hall of Evil or whatever it was earlier. You'd miss yeah. stuff like that, but... And I like how, you know... This this scene with this with this female scientist works. He's trying to convince her that he's not evil, and all he says to her is, you know, when she asks, "Well, how can you prove that you're you're not evil?" He says, "I, I can't. You know, that's for you to judge." Yeah, I've got to say as well. I mean, what year did this come out? It was somewhere in the seventies, wasn't it? Yeah, it was uh, nineteen seventy eight. I like that it's quite progressive in having a, a black female scientist character. I wouldn't have expected that from this era. I'm actually quite impressed by that because let's face it. It was mostly only really star Trek that was trying to 
do those progressive things at the time, as far as I could remember. Yeah, that's that's one thing that, you know, even though it's a criticism of the show, they did try and do, you know, you know, more inclus- inclusion. Um, they oh, is it, not, is it a problem in other episodes then that they're not doing that? No, it's it's a problem in the way they did it. There are characters like Black Vulcan, who is a, a super powered uh, superhero who's African American, and and he's he's essentially Black Lightning, but they couldn't use the character of Black Lightning, right. so he's done very well. Then you have the the character who can grow. That's Apache Chief, and he's hmm. just he's just very pro- stereotypical what we think of as native American. So they've definitely got their good areas and they've got their quite shocking areas too. Yeah. I mean, don't even get me started on El Dorado. Yeah. But you know, this episode being very Star Trek inspired, clearly, maybe that was something that was written into the script. Maybe this writer was like, no, we should, you know, it should be an Ahura type character in this one. Yep. But yeah, you know, I'll give it credit where it's due in this episode. I quite like how progressive that just that small moment was. But obviously, I haven't seen the episodes where it's not so good. So I guess with shows like this, you have to judge it on an episode by episode basis, don't you? Yeah. I do like the voice of Batman in this show. It's very oh, yeah, Adam West inspired. Yeah, that's, that's uh, Olan Soule. He actually was the voice of Batman starting in the sixty the 1969 Filmation Batman series that came out right after the, uh, the Adam West show ended. When did Adam West and Burt Ward actually start doing animation? Because I know there was one series where they actually did do the voices. But I don't know yeah, when that, that was. That was 1979. They did the New Adventures right. of Batman and Robin. Oh, it was that show. Okay. Yeah, and that was actually, you know, um, the first appearance of Batmite in uh, animated. Hmm. I don't remember if that was on the VHS tape that I had as a kid. Hmm. I I think I, it only had something like the first four or five episodes on it, so probably not. I do remember the cool, cruel Mr. Freeze being a good episode, though. Maybe it's not now. If I go back and watch it again, it might not hold up at all. Oh, and his symbol was had the colours reversed. So it's not just the Ruby Spears show that <laughs> gets the symbol's colours yeah, wrong. Yeah, I mean, that that's one of the drawbacks of, of Hanna-Barbera. They s- sometimes yeah. make some screw-ups. Let's face it, you know, you can go back and rewatch even their main shows like Scooby Doo or Flintstones or Jetsons, and you'll see the same problems. Yeah. So all he has to do is open the uh, the flask on the spot where he first appeared, and it should take him back. Mm. Yep. It worked. <laughs> I like that. All he cares about, you know, not that they were shooting it. He was just like, you just ruined a great opportunity. And I like how he sa- he says to Robin when Robin says, "Oh, well, I thank God we'll never have to see those that guy again." He mm. says, "No, I made a promise to somebody, and we've got to keep it." Yeah. Fortunately, there was never ever a sequel to this episode. Yeah, I guess it just happened off screen. Maybe the first thing they should do is put Superman into a kryptonite cage, just so when they do swap places again, this evil Superman can't go anywhere. <laughs> It's probably that would probably be the first thing I would do. Well, I th- I think without well, you know what'll happen is if they had ever done a sequel, it wouldn't be just a swap. It would be a versus type thing. 
fighting yeah. both like that that would be fun either way i enjoyed that episode you know very very mirror mirror yeah i, I liked it quite a bit i wouldn't say that it's going to be on my top list of multiverse stories from dc but it's interesting going back and looking at what is basically the first. Um, yeah, thoroughly enjoyable. Yep. This is this is by far, like you know, as I've said, this is one of my favorite episodes. I remember watching this, you know, the first time it aired on ABC7 here in New York when I was a kid. You know, and that was Saturday morning cartoons for me. You know. Mm. You know, getting up every Saturday morning, waking my dad up and saying, can I put the TV on? And it was always, yes, but put it on low. And that and, you know, that was that was that was Saturday mornings, you know, for me, you know, the Super Friends. I think they were on it like when I at this time, I think it was seven or eight o'clock in the morning. Not sure. It's been a long time. Hmm more than 40 years yeah i mean i think this aired a, a few times when i was a kid um but obviously at a certain point batman the animated series came out and then that was just the show that was always on and then the bruce yeah. tim universe just took over so stuff like this was never really repeated on tv it was never rerun um maybe it was in certain places but obviously just nowhere that i ever saw it um yeah and it's a bit of a shame you know i did enjoy this episode maybe i would have got quite a bit out of it if i'd seen it at the right age i think it's just this is one of those shows where i left it too long so while i really like this episode i don't think i liked it enough where i'm gonna seek out the entire rest of the show i might watch one or two more episodes i'll watch just the ones that you recommend um yeah there is another episode that's on this disc. Um, it's let's see, let me go down. Uh, okay, it's it's called Lex Luthor Strikes Back, and this is a really good one because right around this time is when the Superman movie was out, and wow. we had Luthor's lair underneath Metropolis in the movie. They did a variation on that lair. For this. I like that. I've always loved that lair. You know, I could never get why Miss Teshmucker was so against living where they were. Like that, Lex is right. That is a Park Avenue address like no other. I, I yep. would choose I would choose to live there over just about anywhere else in New York. Well, like I that, think that is an awesome place to be. Yeah, I think her reasoning and it's it makes sense as to why. It was a problem is because it's the secrecy, when you, I imagine, as well. Well, yeah, the secrecy. I mean, you know, that's number one. I mean, you know, a woman who's living in a posh address wants to show it off, wants yeah. people to come over and, and marvel at all the all the stuff they've got. And it's like, yeah, she can't, can't do have, that. The police will find out guess. where I am. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other thing is she can't really go out shopping. Because no. she's, it's almost like a prison, that place. I mean, Otis gets to go out, so. And let's face it, she has a lot of very nice clothing. You know, she always has, like, very posh, upper-class sort of clothes. Um, often very sexually suggestive clothing, but at the same time. Well, that's because. Uh, if, that, if, that, if that's what she likes, that's what she likes. a very nice body, and we had to show it off. Yeah, that is pretty much the only reason. Um, but either way, you know, I imagine she did get to go out, but maybe she, like you say, maybe she wanted to throw a party every now and then, invite some friends over. You can't do that when it's a secret lair. It is right. Yeah. You know, if Lex was just to give up the life of crime and live there just legitimately, maybe it would be a whole different story. But either way, you know, if I could move into that, place i would in a heartbeat man that, that place is just awesome um so yeah maybe we'll have to watch that episode where we'll get to see it in animation at some point um yep so either way what would you give this out of 10 i would probably give this an eight you know 
because I was going to go seven point seven five, but I yeah I can be talked into eight. Yeah, I'm happy with I mean, eight. Yes, they are essentially the crime syndicate of America without actually doing the crime syndicate. Yes, mm. they 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 got away with you know not creating new character designs for these characters just by simply taking the ori the original cells and recoloring them, you know, adding some some modifications to them. Yeah. Um, I mean, but, let's face it, stuff like increasing the, the length of Batman's ears or just adding the black under Superman's eyes or adding a mustache, that's pretty minimal in terms yeah. of modifications, isn't it? So, yeah, I, I appreciate that um, they found a way of doing it. It is a shame that it's not the crime syndicate, but as you say, you know, budgetary li limitations, you can't help that. Um it's not Although the same I, situation as they had with Justice League, or was it Justice League Unlimited when they had the JSA episode that they weren't allowed to use the JSA? So they really it was, it was uh, season one of Je of Justice League. It was, uh, uh, yeah, it was the Justice Guild, right? Obviously, it was supposed to be the JSA. They just didn't have the right to use that team for some stupid reason i don't know well i think i think that was right around the time when they had launched the jsa comic and paul levitz the the publisher of dc at the time he says you know this is gonna you know, we just launched the jsa and this episode is gonna kind of bring it down i would argue the exact opposite i would say that that episode if it was good, I haven't actually seen it in quite some time. But, you know, if it's good, that brings readers to the comic. Yeah. You know, it's like how, you know, let's face it. The comic sales for Spider-Man absolutely skyrocketed after the first Sam Raimi movie came out. Because there were all these people that suddenly were like, I actually really like this character. I'm going to read some comics. Didn't yeah. last very long. But it never really does. But the people that really connected with those comics probably did stick around. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe allowing the show to use the JSA properly might have actually brought some extra readers to his series. You know, I, I think part of the reason was that, you know, there is some slightly overt racism and sexism amongst the Justice Guild. You know, like when... Mm. Uh, when the streak teams up with John Stewart, you know, and they're flying to stop the bad guy, you know, the streak says to John Stewart, you're a credit to your people. That could be taken I, as, oh, he's a credit to, you know, his world or he's a credit to black people. Yeah. Did it turn out that they were like the bad guys or something? Or was it just a really weird moment in the writing? No, what it was was um, the character of Ray Thompson, who's basically named for uh, Roy Thomas and Ray uh, Bradbury. Bradbury We're known right. for nostalgic stuff. He was basically a mutant after the nuclear war, and he recreated the Justice Guild with his psychic abilities. Right, so they weren't quite the real people. They weren't. They were just his memories of them. But right. so he's got his own issues with race and stuff like that, and so he's given it to them without necessarily yeah. even meaning to. But still, it's it's kind of overt at the same time, and you know, mm. you know, I mean, I mean, Black Siren, the Black Canary of the team. She basically says, "Let's let's go let the men talk at, while we go make cookies." She says that to Hawk. Girl. Yeah. I mean, unless the JSA are JSA from history, but wasn't it supposed to be like a parallel Earth thing? In it, this it, it was. Yeah, it was a parallel Earth. Yeah. So I mean, it off. might have made sense if it was the JSA, and it's like, well, they're from the 1940s. What did you expect? Like that, yeah. that would have made sense character wise why they might have had some slightly outdated attitudes. But if it's just a parallel earth, it doesn't make as much sense. So maybe, maybe the episode just needed a couple of rewrites or something to make it more in line with what we well, expect. 
I, I can see Paul Levitz's point. I also can say, and, and plus the fact that the characters die at the end of the episode. So. Yeah. But then, you know, it's the infinite multiverse. You don't have to say that they're the main JSA. It might just, at some point, they have another multiverse story and they find a JSA from a, yeah, a different Earth or something, you know. Yeah. That's the beauty well, of the JSA. Because they're I from will... a parallel Earth sometimes, you know, you can basically have as many bows at it as you like. <laughs> I will say this, though. The actors that they got to play, the characters in the Justice Guild, you know, I mean, their their version of Green Lantern, Green Guardsman, that was William Cat. Huh. And uh, huh. The Streak, their version it's, of the William of Jay Cat. Garrick. Is William Cat the one from Greatest American Hero? Yep. Yeah, I, I, I mostly know him from Jerome Bixby's The Man from Earth. But he's fantastic in that movie. Yep. But then most um, of the characters in that are. There's a lot of Star Trek actors in it. Um, yeah, the streak is James Norton, who's uh, best known for being one of the uh, astronauts on the TV version of the Planet of the Apes. Hmm. James Norton. I definitely know the name. Oh, I recognize him. No idea what from, though. And there's another James Norton who's quite a bit younger, so it's obviously not him. Yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah, I, I can't say if I know him from anything particularly. And then Catman um, of the JSA, who's essentially like a combination between Batman and Wildcat, is uh, I forget the actor's name, but he was the big boss on news radio. He was mm. also the voice of uh, of Zorel in uh, Superman uh, Unbound. Stephen Root. It's Stephen Root. Oh, I like Stephen Root. He was good in uh, Office Space. He was good in Barry recently. Yep. Every time I see Stephen Root pop up in something, I like him. Yep. And then plus plus the villains that they got, they got uh, Michael McKeon as the sportsmaster or sportsman in this case. Um, I always love Michael McKeon. I don't think I've ever seen him put in a bad performance. There's yeah. um, one of my favorite childhood movies was released, I think, a year before Flight of the Navigator, but it's a very similar movie. And it's uh, just called Daryl, and it stars yep. the kid from Never Ending Story. He, yeah, Michael McKean is great in that, just as the dad of this robot boy. Um, if that little description, I know I've not sold it the best way, but you know, if you do want to check out this movie, the entire thing is on YouTube. So enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's there's characters like uh, Sir Swami, who was uh, um, I think that who was the voice that was voiced by Jeffrey Jones from from Beetlejuice. Yeah, uh, music master was Udo Kier. It's funny, Jeffrey Jones is one of those actors that. I was a pretty big fan of, but I can't watch him in anything anymore. Just since yeah. all that stuff about him came out. Yeah, I I don't know. Let's face it, there's probably a reason that Beetlejuice 2 opens with the funeral of that character. <laughs> He's the only character yeah. they didn't want to bring back. Yeah. Anyway, oh, and there's one other member of the of the uh, Justice Guild of America that I forgot, and that's Tom Turbine. Yeah. He's right. essentially a cross between the Golden Age Adam and Superman, and mm -hmm. he's voiced by Ted McGinley. Huh. I like Ted McGinley. I can't remember the last time I saw him in anything actually, but that's interesting. Hmm. Oh well. Anyway. Um, we gave, both gave this an, what was it, an 8.5 or an 8, was it? An 8, an 8. An 8. Okay, yeah, I think that's fair enough. Um, let us know what you think. Is there a, any other episode of Super Friends in particular that you want us to uh, watch at some point? Um, you know, we always take the suggestions and add them to the list. Uh, who knows, we might even get to it next week. Um, either way, thank you all so much for watching. We'll see you next time. 
Viacom 